Hi everyone, this is uh, Russell Day uh, here. I'm the chairperson of the uh, Business and Legal Studies area. We're going to get started with our webinar uh, at this point. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody this evening to uh, Meet the Entrepreneur. Um, tonight we have uh, John Schroeder um, and we're excited to have him. He has quite a, he's been uh, a presenter once before and uh, he has uh, quite a few stories he can tell about businesses that he's um, uh, run and started. Um, again, my name's Russell Day, and I'll be the host. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Business and Legal Studies program here at Penn Foster, uh, and we're happy to have John Schroeder here. Um, he's going to be talking about a, a, an experience he had starting and running a business, and I'll be turning the webinar over to John in uh, just a moment. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that um, everyone can hear me. Um, so if you can just, uh, uh, you know, uh, type in your name uh, in the question box just to make sure that that's working. Uh, I see that some people, I guess, can hear me. So, oh yeah, definitely. Okay. All right. You can definitely hear me. I can see that. <laughs> okay. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know tonight's presentation is going to uh, be on a business that uh, Sean started. Uh, it was a uh, uh, recording business. Uh, I know in the advertisement it did say that he was going to be talking about a, a non-alcoholic um, uh, uh, business, a, 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 a nightclub. Um, however, uh, there was some confusion between me and him, and I got I'm, I was the one that was wrong on that, and I had the wrong information to put up on the advertisement. So he will be talking about a, a, a recording business that he started and ran, um, and uh, you know I think you'll find it really interesting. Uh, goes over a lot of things that you need to think about when you start a small business. So um, we'll try and do the uh, the um, uh, non-alcoholic nightclub uh, after the new year so you know you'll have an opportunity here to, to hear about that as well um, before we start let me uh, just take a moment to make sure everybody's uh, familiar with the webinar uh, control panel um, first you should have a control panel on the right side of your screen it looks like everybody's figured out how to use the question box uh, you can minimize that control panel using uh, the, air, the arrow in the upper left corner of the control panel. Um, you can also click on that to expand it back out again if you want to um, uh, ask a question. Um, you'll have the ability to submit questions. Looks like uh, most of you have figured that out. Um, you can submit them at any time during the webinar. I'm going to be monitoring the questions and I'll be uh, giving them to uh, John as we go through the webinar. I can tell you we do have a large number of students for this webinar. Um, it's almost 200 students at this point, so I, I don't know that we'll get through all your questions, um, but uh, we'll try to do the best we can. Um, if we're not able to get through uh, any of your all the questions, uh, we'll try to uh, answer them after the webinar. So you might be hearing from us by email in a, in a couple days. Um, let's see. We've allowed 90 minutes for this webinar. Um, I'm not sure that we'll use all of that time, um, but the last time we had one of these sessions, I only allowed an hour, and we went for 90 minutes. So <laughs> um, I figured that uh, we'll we'll do the 90 minutes this time, and if we you know, or, or do the whole thing, then that's great. If we don't, uh, we don't. Um, also, uh, just so you know that this webinar uh, is being recorded and will be posted on the community um, in the academic area on the, uh, the business uh, page of the academic area. So you'll probably see that in two or three days. Um, so if anything that you missed that you want to go back and listen to it again or, or to uh, you know, let your friends know about it, uh, we'll have it up there uh, in the next uh, two or three days. So um, let's get started here. Um, as I said, today uh, we have uh, John Schroeder as a presenter. He's owned and operated many types of businesses and we'll be talking about his uh, experience starting a uh, recording studio. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to John uh, so that he can uh, 
uh, just share a little bit about his uh, experience and then get started with the presentation. So, uh, John, take it away. Very good. Thanks, Russell. I hope everybody can hear me well enough. Uh, you'll have to type it in if there's some kind of tech problem and uh, let Russell know, and then he'll be able to pass it on to me. So I am not able to see the questions as they come up on the screen there. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of background. Russ, go ahead and change the slide to the uh, key ingredients in starting a business. <clears throat> and let me give you a little bit of, uh, of uh, background for myself as far as how I wound up in being an entrepreneur in the first place. I started out um, trying to avoid school all I could. And uh, one of the uh, jobs that I wound up taking early on and not going on in college was to become a I'm, radio dish jockey. Oh, yeah. I'm Russ. sorry, John. Can, can you hold on one moment? I seem to be having a technical problem here. I see the uh, uh, slide there. Are you able? OK, so, uh, there we go. OK. All right, so we have the starting a business slide from Stretch. Okay, there we go. It was giving me a problem for some reason. Uh, yeah, go to the next slide because I have a feeling it's truncating the bottom. Yeah, it looks like. Hold, hold on one moment. I seem to be having an issue here. It's not doing as I expected it to do. Let's just get this set up. Well, you know, actually, I, I still go on with the background while you're solving the technical part okay. of it so that they're not. Go ahead. Okay. The, um, I went to work as a uh, radio broadcaster who took a, uh, a kind of like a certificate course. It takes about six months to be able to go through in order to be able to learn what it takes in order to be a dish jockey. And so I went to work for a couple of small stations out in Riverside, San Bernardino, where I was able to, you know, cut my teeth on it and learn how to be able to play the heavy hits on the air. To give you an idea of how long ago this was, it was back when the Bee Gees were number one in America, and YMCA was the big number one hit at the time. So if uh, that goes far enough back, that was probably before most of you were born. But uh, that was where I learned first how not only to be able to talk, uh, you know, on the air as a dish jockey, we actually did all of our own spending of records, playing the commercials, reading public service announcements, and that sort of thing. And I took the skills that we had at that time uh, into a recording studio that uh, began shortly after I left the radio station. I didn't leave of my own accord. I walked in one day and uh, they had let all of the on-air broadcasters go. And that happens in radio because when they changed the music format, and they did go disco, by the way, uh, we were adult contemporary before then, suddenly I go in and they say, uh, you know, you're fired. And I said, but I've been such a good employee. And they go, oh, that doesn't matter. We don't want to confuse our listeners by having the same broadcasters uh, now that we've gone to disco that we did with adult contemporaries. So thank you very much. We'll give you an excellent reference because you were a great employee. So I was about 23 years old, and that uh, told me that everything my parents had said about go to work for an employer and work really hard to do everything that uh, they want you to do, and you'll have a job with them forever. Well, that didn't quite work out. That was when I first decided to become self-employed, and it kind of stuck from that point on. I ran into another disillusioned uh, dish jockey out there by the name of Eric Alvarez, and he had actually convinced his parents to uh, put a recording studio into their garage. And so we used the equipment that they had right there in order to be able to start producing radio commercials for uh, marketing agencies, advertising agencies. And then it turned over to uh, a matter of networking. And I'll be able to get into that uh, a little bit on. It looks like Russ has this, so I can get back on vogue with the slides here. So if you can see the key ingredients, let's, uh, yeah, we are truncating the uh, very last line at the bottom, Russ. Can you zoom that out just a little bit more? It says uh, you can never read it again, but it will guide all your decisions. And then there's one line, it says your decision should be the last two uh, words down on that slide. So if you zoomed it to, I don't know, 65, yeah. it might make it. All right, hang on a minute here. No problem. Yeah, you can see it there. Try it now. Oh, right. yeah, it's still a 72, so 
Yeah, I seem to be having trouble changing it for some reason. Well, I think they'll probably be able to read it just uh, just as it is. If you, uh, it's probably more Why don't important. Why do it to, this way? Yeah, yeah, to have the entire slide and then just uh, go ahead and, and click them down on the left as we go. Yeah, it's, right. it's not letting me uh, minimize it, or I mean, uh, uh, lower the uh, the screen. Okay, why don't we try that? Yeah, it's readable. <clears throat> Very good. All right. So if you take a look here, this is uh, really just my own development right here. You'll see a few graphics and such out of a, a marketing textbook and such. But these key ingredients are really my own personal experience as far as what it took in order to be able to get the business started. Now, mind you, this is very different from something else. I mean, if we all decided one day we wanted to go out there and you know start. Uh, manufacturing widgets, you know, that's the infamous thing they use in e uh, economics. If we wanted to say we were going to make widgets and there were thousands of widget makers already and we were going to make it a thousand and one, uh, you know, there's already a tried and true method. You would go out there and find out what somebody has already done correctly and then role model it after them. Well, I was getting into a business that we're going to talk about today in this recording studio that had not really been done before, certainly not in the way that we did it. So uh, let me go into, if you were going to start with your own business, I'm going to assume you did not do it the way I did, and that is starting a business from scratch in which you were actually trailblazing the whole thing. So if you look at that top bullet point there, you want to get an overview of the industry that you're in, uh, entering. So th it's really not just enough to understand the services or product that, uh, that's being made there. Uh, for instance, if you really need to understand how business in general works. You don't count on just your technical knowledge. Uh, a good example of this would be like an artist would not typically be the best art gallery manager. So you can wind up being an art gallery owner and being an artist, but you need to have managers that are good in uh, leadership and managing and operations and just running back office uh, things in order to be able to get that to go. There are really two different functions out there as far as what it has to do with your products and services and what it has to do with making the business run. So make sure that you're clear on that. If you have no background in back office and how the business side of it works, pick a competitor that you, you know, admire or wish to emulate. That means copy. And then get to know them inside and out. You might want to get an intern position or go to work for them even in order to be able to get a behind the scenes look at what it is that, uh, that they do in order to make the place a success. You certainly want to be able to work out your financial forecast, and that means you're going to, you know, forecast how much money do you have coming in, how much do you have going out in the way of expenses, and can you live on what's left over. And what I see happen with this most often is that that's inaccurate. The people that put those together, it's just wildly exaggerated, and the next thing you know, what you wound up having as a great tool in the beginning of this spreadsheet that said, look at how successful we're going to be, ended up being a huge lie instead. And that doesn't do you any good, since you're the one that ends up paying for it. One of the tougher things to do is to figure out how to get the business going with a startup budget. And a lot of people will say, well, we got to get loans from the, you know, from this bank or maybe the Small Business Administration will, uh, will be able to arrange a loan from them or we'll bring in partners who all have this money. Do not try to start a business based on shoulda, woulda, couldas. Go out there and make it happen according to what you actually have in hand. In my case for the recording studio, I understood how to do the back office stuff, and it was my partner, Eric, who wound up having all of the equipment to get it started, and it was out of his parents' garage. So we really had solved a lot of our problems just by the two of us right there. And then you really have to understand, okay, what do you do if you are a success? You know, you're going to wind up growing, and so you have to understand the, uh, uh, as you grow, you have to have an idea of who are we going to add and what order in terms of staff. Marketing includes, uh, you know, not only deciding what new products you have, but how to sell the ones that you currently have and how to make them even better as you go. So all of those things uh, are as a part of your plan for growth. And then you want to make sure that you put this all down in writing to the very last detail. And that's known as a business plan. And the interesting thing is almost every entrepreneur I ever talk to, and we are like birds of a feather, we, we tend to know each other, 
what happens is you put this big three ring, uh, three inch, three ring binder plan together and you have everything written down in there and you put it up on a shelf and you almost never open that thing again. And honest to God, you do and you feel like, oh my God, if I put that much time and effort into it, don't you think I would wind up referring to it over and over again? Well, that's entirely possible, but I'll tell you, after you put that much effort into it, you know everything that's inside that three ring binder and it guides every decision you have in your brain. So every time you have a something come up, you already know it's inside of those three entries of uh, three ring binder and you'll be able to figure that one out for yourself. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide if you could, Russell. Uh, John, before we yeah. move on, I've got a couple of questions here, sure. non, somewhat n not specific, but dealing with uh, sources of money. Maybe you could kind of uh, expand on that a little bit. Uh, you know, what kind of sources do you look for for funds for starting a business? Well, there's uh, there's a couple of ways that you can go about that. Uh, one of the things that's kind of nice is when you see all of these uh, uh, movies that are like on uh, uh, Facebook or um, uh, Bill Gates or uh, Steve Jobs, how did those people get started, you know, in the, in the electronics field? And they're able to go in and talk about the various things like VC or venture capital, in which you go find people almost like Shark Tank. Most people are familiar with that. And that's truly a television show based in, it really streamlines the process of finding people with money who want to be able to charge you way too much uh, in order to, uh, and I say charge you way too much, that means they're going to take a big piece of ownership of the business in order to uh, be able to provide the funds that it would take to get you established. So that uh, venture capital is certainly one way. Another way is to be able to do that is small business uh, administration or an SBA loan. Uh, SBA loans, typically you will I'll tell you, reasonably, you can't do a startup business from an SBA uh, scenario. The reason being is they need at least a two-year history of the business. So in other words, what you need to do is to go take over an existing business and have basically 35 to 40 percent down. So if you were buying a business just to make it round numbers for $100,000, you would need to have at least $35,000 to put down and the SBA would be able to come up with the additional money to, uh, to allow you to do that purchase. Uh, when you do that, they own you. I mean, for as long as you have an SBA loan, anything you buy is going to be subject to them. They will have a lien on your house and cars and everything else, and uh, until you get that loan paid back to them, those liens are going to remain in place. So it makes it very hard to buy a home, it makes it very hard to refinance one and so on if you go down that road. So you have venture capital, you have the SBA, and typically what people do is to get mom and dad to help them out. And uh, I can tell you that I guess that's more or less what Eric Alvarez and I did because the major dollars actually came from his parents and they set up the recording studio in the garage there, which, uh, uh, you know, they had set aside money for his college education and he talked him into putting it into uh, setting him up for becoming a broadcaster. So it was mom and dad who came up with the money in that case and then it was our expertise beyond that that made it successful. So that's, uh, those are the three just overviews. I'll have a, a actually in the uh, next one with the Teenage No Alcohol Nightclub uh, that we'll talk about early next year, I'll be able to go into that and uh, some more specifics as far as how we were able to actually do that. Uh, John, I have another question from Morgan here. Um, they're asking, uh, what was your biggest failure when you were first starting out and uh, what did you learn from the failure? Uh, yeah, it's a great question, and, uh, and oddly enough, I, I, I will go into detail of that. The uh, the partner, uh, Eric Alvarez, and myself uh, got along famously when it came to the recording studio. We added, we both went into a 50-50 partnership into the uh, no alcohol nightclub business, and that was when I found one of the huge flaws that both he and I had made. It was a mistake as far as re recognizing that we were not compatible in how we want to grow a business. I found out that my plan was in order to make money, you have to spend money and provide the best service you possibly can. His concept was to make money by saving every penny and therefore, if you don't have to go out there and improve your uh, advertising, improve the service, improve the product that you have, there's no need for you to go out there and spend money to do that. And you can just put it in your pocket. So uh, that was the biggest mistake that I had made right off the bat was to go out there and not make sure who I partnered up with I was going to be compatible with in the long run.
it worked fine as long as there was no money to go around. Once we started making money is when it became obvious. Okay. Um, just have another question here from Amina. Um, she, she understands uh, there are free business grants that are given by the government. Are you aware of uh, any of those? Uh, I am, and it uh, it winds up being something. Uh, this has to do more with nonprofit organizations that I've been involved with, and what you uh, go out there and write grant applications. Believe me, you if you're going to go down that road. You're, when I was talking about your three-inch three-ring binder to be able to write your business plan, you're going to have a five-inch three-ring binder to be able to just do a grant application. And if you do want to go down that road, in order to be successful at it, you, you need to get a consultant on your side who knows how to write these things and to get the people's attention. It's one thing to know that there's a, a uh, you know, program out there to be able to donate or get government money granted to you for things, but the people who get these are like the uh, you know, doctorates at Stanford and Harvard who put the proposal together. That, like I said, the things are huge and they follow a specific format and you're going to pay somebody between five and ten thousand dollars to be able to write that grant for you. So if you're going down that, uh, down that road, it's not easy to do and I suggest that you probably have a whole lot better ways to be able to go after money that are uh, much more, uh, shall I say, concrete. Okay. All right, I know we have some other questions here, but we're going to move on with the presentation um, and uh, see if uh, some of your questions are answered as we go through the, uh, the presentation. Oh, sure. Uh, this uh, gra graphic right here was taken out of a textbook, and it's one worth uh, remembering if you remember this session's being recorded, so you'll be able to come back to this at another time. But those uh, seven steps right there, as far as starting at the bottom step of research and analysis, uh, or analyze the market up to the select target market, identify objectives, set budget, develop promotional mix, implement plans, and evaluate the results. That is definitely what you do if you're trying to promote from scratch everything that you're going to be doing out there. So uh, let's uh, let me take just a quick example, and let's say that we decide we want to go into the uh, car industry, that we want to be able to sell cars to people. So we're going to go out there and say, what does it take to be able to get hooked up with, uh, you know, Rolls Royce and Mercedes Benz and BMW and uh, Cadillac and Buick and uh, Chevy? And so we're looking at all those, and we say, which of those brands of cars do we want to be able to sell? And the next thing you do to be able to figure that out is to select your target market and say, we would like low to medium income families in order to, you know, people and families in order to be able to sell a whole lot more cars because it's a much lower price in order to buy a Chevy, let's say, than it is to buy a BMW or a Rolls Royce. So uh, basically all buyers can afford, if you're able to buy a car, everybody's able to buy, uh, afford one of the Chevrolet products, but not necessarily a Mercedes or a uh, Rolls Royce. So you're saying, I'd like to be able to exchange volume for the uh, quality and price out there. So that's how you would go about selecting your target market to figure out who is it that I'm trying to sell to, and then identifying the objectives as the specific car and how you're going to be able to sell it to them. I'll just cover the other four later on, but I just wanted to get us going uh, right off the uh, bat. So uh, you're going to see this slide a few times, so don't worry about uh, trying to write all these down and missing it right now. Go on to the next one, Russell, if you would. So we're going to take a look at uh, slide number four, and it winds up talking about that research and analyze the market, and I'm going to get specifically into what I wound up doing initially. Uh, this is an interesting way to, that it occurred for me in networking. Here I am as a disc jockey going to a recording studio. Were we making radio commercials? Yes, we were. Were we making money? We did fine. But the one thing, if you really want to make money as an entrepreneur, is you need to disconnect what you do per hour is in terms of the revenue that you make. For instance, when you're a singer and uh, you go into a nightclub and you start making money for every one of the gigs that you do, yeah, you can go ahead and get by on that. When do they get really rich? When you wind up being a famous recording artist, you sing the song one time and then you sell a million copies of it. If you're starting to understand the difference there, get yourself disengaged from having an hourly price and get uh, over into a way of being able to sell, doing the work one time and selling it over and over and over. Just ask Bill Gates and selling discs of uh, Windows. Uh, 
and you'll understand the difference there. Well, I found out from my brother, who is a band director, that there was a real need for the technique called editing that I had learned to do back in the radio business. So I was able to go ahead and make a song that was, say, you might call it a remix, where you take a song that was maybe five minutes, and then all of a sudden I need to cut it down to two minutes in length. And I can do that, especially having a musical background, which I did. I was a band geek in high school. And I was able to go ahead and physically cut audio, reel-to-reel -reel tape, and tape it back together again so that you would not be able to tell where the edit was if you knew how to do it right, which I did. And my brother asked me to be able to do that for a number of performing groups at his school. He was in charge of uh, drill team and song leaders and color guard and cheerleaders. And all of them needed music to be able to be edited for them. So I was doing that for him. And I said, but I've got to be able to get away from just charging this per hour charge for these uh, groups that have to be able to come into my recording studio to be able to do this. And so I was looking for the one thing that would allow me to be able to get there. And there were all kinds of problems. First of all, there were changing time limits. As you went to one thing to another, they had a different time limit for every darn competition you went to. Uh, and, and of course, there were a lot of objections to you know trying to figure out, nobody wants to buy something just off of a song title. They really want to hear the song first before they do it. So there were a couple of options. And I told you the ones about my brother, another one, uh, uh, with the high school stuff, there was another one uh, that really showed some promise initially, which was ice skating. Uh, they used music as well, and you've seen it as an Olympic event, but it tended to have the same issues because ice skating programs went anywhere from two to seven minutes, and so it was hard to cut a song once, one time, and be able to sell it over and over and over again. So that was a real problem that I had to get through. In 1980, they had a, a huge change in uh, women's gymnastics. Men's gymnastics to this day doesn't use music, but women's gymnastics always did. And up until 1980, the, uh, the rule was is that you could have only a single instrument, usually a piano, but it could be like a guitar or something like that. And uh, that was what they were doing the routines to. In 1980, the uh, Olympic Committee agreed that they would allow fully orchestrated, so you could have everything from the latest rock band to the Chicago uh, Symphony playing the song out there, as long as there were no lyrics in the song, so you didn't have a vocalist singing. So if there was just music, they were allowing anything that you had out there. And this was huge, because overnight, there were 100,000 gymnasts in the United States, and every one of them had music that didn't uh, exploit the full potential of being orchestrated because everything they had was a single instrument, probably on a piano. Next slide, Russell. Okay. Number five. Uh, I have a couple questions here. Sure. Um, if you uh, want to take them. Uh, we've got a uh, really good question here. Uh, can you recall the best piece of advice anyone has ever given you? Uh, was the advice uh, given to you from people outside the business uh, a boost to your business? Hmm. Best piece of advice? That <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, it, it was very generic. It, 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 uh, the best thing that I ever got out there really came to me from school, from college. I had a, uh, a teacher who was in a night class, and he was still in the real working world out there doing his thing. And uh, I kind of asked the same question of him one time. I said, if there was one thing that uh, you know I could walk away from all your experiences that you shared with us, what... Uh, what would that uh, wind up being? And he goes, don't ever assume that things that you don't know about are easy. It's very simple for us to make that mistake, to go out there and think, oh, I don't know about that, but accounting is easy and brain surgery is easy. I'm using both of those as uh, trying to, to set the point out there because the moment that you assume something, is, it's very simple for us to do that because we'd like to be able to downplay it. Bosses do it all the time where they go out there and go, oh, you know, whatever you're doing, that's pretty easy stuff. And, yeah, I don't know what it is, but that's how come I'm up here and you're down there because you know how to do the easy stuff. That can be. I'm not saying all bosses are like that, but uh, that, that was probably it. Do not assume the things that you do not know about or how to do are easy. What was the other one, Russell? You said there were two. Um, yeah, um, well, I've got quite a few here, but I, I just, we're not going to be able to go through all of them. 
Um, the other one was uh, about uh, investing as far as uh, issuing stock or, or anything like that. Do you Have you ever done that in your business or would you recommend that as a way to um, set up a business? Yeah, that's the uh, that's the danger of watching the uh, things about Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and uh, you know Zuckerman or the Facebook guy, uh, as far as how they wind up doing. Because when it gets to you know a movie made for TV or even for the big screen, uh, it, they wind up talking about IPOs or uh, initial public offerings. Uh, to be able to issue stock if you have a private corporation, and that means that you do not sell stock on the stock exchange to you know the general public like you do with those other companies that I mentioned, uh, you actually do issue stock certificates so that it shows that you know these are my you know 50% of shares or whatever it is that you have in the company. So no matter what kind of corporation that you uh, decide, even an LLC is going to designate what the percentage of ownership or shares are. Uh, uh, out there between the partners that are involved. Uh, once you start to, and I have done this as well as far as gone to a uh, public uh, offering in which you sell stock to the public and that is a huge process. I mean we took a whole year of going through the uh, accounting scrubbing and inspection and audit that they do on uh, just your accounting systems alone, let alone all your other procedures out there. So uh, do you issue stock? Yes. If, no matter what level you do it in, yes, stock is issued. Um, it is a different kind of stock for an LLC than it is for an S corporation than it is for a C corporation. I, I know you didn't you know, want to get into the details of that, and I'm not going to, but believe me that there are all kinds of different ways of doing that. But basically, just think of it in terms of percentages. You know, you, uh, Eric Alvarez and I were 50-50 partners in that, and he had 50% of the ownership, and I had 50% of the ownership, and it actually went from a partnership to a uh, subchapter S corporation to a C corporation that we literally could have gone public with eventually and did not in that case. So I, I think that answered it, but it's a, it's a question that really is not to, not to even worry about it until you get down the road. Okay. I'm uh, going to move on here then. Okay. We can, uh, what we're talking about, uh, oh, go back one. I think I skipped, I didn't oh, talk did about I? the number five. There we go. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about why gymnastics wound up being such a good fit. And this is really, this is where the legality, because I was, I was almost expecting somebody to come up and say, isn't there, aren't there like, uh, you know, laws against being able to record music like you were talking about and then selling it again? And I want to, uh, let me tell you, in 1980, did you know that MTV wasn't on the air yet? Did you know that CDs had not been invented yet? So there was no such thing as digital music at the time. Uh, so this is this is going back before the invention of all of that stuff, and it took quite a while until those things actually came along. So where this fell into was a very interesting gap in between things. Uh, you're seeing a couple of uh, uh, names up there: ASCAP, ASCAP, American Society of Composers and Performers. That's one of the licensing agencies, and they are the people that uh, are in charge of licensing complete original songs. Now you'll hear of other ones, uh, British Music Incorporated, BMI, and CSAC, I don't even remember what that stands for, but those three main ones cover 99% of all licensing out there, and it's the complete original song. That's what they are in charge of licensing. So if you were to play their complete original song, you would have to pay them money. Radio stations do that all the time. Uh, then there's another company that is called Harry Fox Agency. Harry Fox has an interesting niche that ASCAP and BMI don't even deal with, and that is for a song that is redone. For instance, uh, the song Yesterday by the Beatles is the most copied tune ever done out there. Every time somebody other than the Beatles does Yesterday, they send money to Harry Fox. So anybody that's a tribute band copying things or even live performances, like if you went to see uh, Phantom of the Opera uh, uh, as a live performance that is also licensed by Harry Fox as far as money that would go to them. Well, since Harry Fox is either dealing with an entirely new production of a song and ASCAP is dealing with the original hit that was out there and all we were doing was taking little pieces of the song and editing them together without having any lyrics in it, neither one of these companies handled it. Now, mind you, I, I knew people in both of those organizations. Roy, Roy Camp was the vice president of ASCAP on the West Coast, and I called him up and said, 
Roy, here's what I'm getting ready to do. What, uh, you know, what, how do you license me for it? And when I explained it to him, he sent me to Harry Fox. He says, we don't do it, they do it. So I talked to Harry Fox and they go, we don't do it. I think it falls under ASCAP because you're using the original music. Bottom line is, is I got both of them to agree. Neither one of us handled what it is that you do. But they did say, you're going to get big enough someday. And if you do, we'll come find you. <laughs> and so uh, they said, at that point, you will get a cease and desist letter that says, quit doing what you're doing, and let's sit down and figure out uh, you know, how to properly license you, and we'll go from there. I said, okay, that's what we'll do. So that was, uh, it, that was the first thing on the legalities. The other thing is that the time limit between 70 and 90 seconds for gymnastics, and remember, this was a Olympic sport, so that 70 to 90 seconds didn't change when I went from California to Arizona to Texas to Florida to New York. That changed never. Throughout the entire world, they use the same 70 to 90 seconds because the International Music Olympics, or I'm, saying, I'm sorry, International Olympics regarding the music for gymnastics wound up being the same time limit no matter what country or region you were in. So we were able to produce a song one time that fit what the gymnastics people needed, and we were good to go. That was what I had been looking for all this time that wasn't being satisfied by any of the high school groups or ice skating or anything else. Okay, next slide, Russell. Number six. Okay. I have a good question here for you. Um, let me see. Um, do, do you ever find yourself losing the joy you had in, in doing, a, you know, running a business uh, on your own time? Um, do you start feeling obligated? Uh, that's a great question, and it, it, it changes from one personality to another. I can tell you that I have had, uh, if I were to take all the different uh, entrepreneurial things that I've done, I've probably had eight careers in my life. I'm 60 years old now, and I started doing that when I was 23. So about 40 years, so I do one thing, if I were to average it out, I do one thing about every five years. And uh, if, so if you look at that, for somebody like myself, I love the challenge of starting a new business. Once the business turns into a you do something day to day to day, I hire people to take it over. Uh, actually, some of you may know my wife because she's your registrar, uh, Stephanie. I literally taught Stephanie how to do what it is that I did in the recording studio, and she really liked continuing to do the day to day to day stuff as I went on to do other things later on. So it was. Uh, it, uh, it is a personality trait that changes from one individual to another. Whether it, whereas my wife is much better at being able to handle the uh, the repeating kind of tasks that are out there, uh, that was not for me. And so we made the best of what she could do and what I could do, and it worked out to be very good. But that's a great question because it shows some insight and understanding that, yeah, what seems exciting today may not seem exciting tomorrow. Okay. Uh, go ahead there. All righty. Uh, so we're uh, in researching and analyzing the uh, market in terms of the competition. There were two competitors out there, and uh, one of them was a uh, was the guy who had been editing the music for all of the U.S. Olympians along the way, and he would do a few songs and charge a lot of money to be able to do them in terms of. Uh, you know, customizing it to exactly what they needed. And so he would, uh, you know, went, again, he was being paid by the hour to be able to produce these things. The other one had the idea of being able to do mass production, but he ran into a lot of objections. He was out of the uh, San Diego area, and he had a company called Syntrax, as you can see it on there. It's S-Y-N, talking about being a synthesizer, which was like kind of like a huge church organ that has all those buttons and that you can throw to make different sounds and all that, but it basically still sounds like a synthesizer with different uh, uh, you know, musical instruments coming out of the same thing. So it, it really wasn't that. It sounded like the Main Street Electrical Parade from Disneyland. That's a synthesizer that put that together. And he had like, oh, 20 different songs on a single vinyl record, and you could buy that for 30 bucks. It wasn't a popular option because a lot of people, you know, if you have 100,000 gymnasts and you only have 20 songs, if everybody bought the same record, you'd have 5,000 gymnasts competing with the same song just to, you know, use an easy average. If you're wondering what a pause button edit is, that's trying to do what I was doing by physically cutting reel-to-reel -reel tape. They would try to time it where they're recording onto a cassette and time the 
turning on and off the pause button so that it was perfectly lined up with the beats and you didn't miss a beat along the way. Almost impossible to do, but didn't mean that people didn't try to do it anyway. So those were our competitors out there at the time, and we had to be able to go around it. Go to the next uh, slide, some real bright yellow there, number seven, Russell, and you'll oh, be able okay. to see this is actually a, uh, a image from, this is uh, Floor Express Music, I see. Uh, these people are out there today and, uh, and are doing this, taking full advantage of uh, the internet and uh, high technology and all that to be able to do that. And so the, but this, is, uh, this is a competitor that came along and tried to copy everything that we did later on. I mean, we're about to go into it here, uh, that did later on from 1980 on. In fact, you'll see our first ad in the next slide. These are going to go a lot faster now, Russell. Okay. Uh, this is the first ad that we put together. This is called a tear sheet. It was actually the inside back cover of IG or International Gymnast magazine. And the most important thing, uh, we also did it as a mailer. That's why you're seeing a U-fold. You see the two lines in the middle is actually uh, able to fold up like an envelope and mail it out, <clears throat> just like that. But there are a number of things that you're seeing on there. Uh, not just you know trying to pro project a huge image for United Productions, but you can see that the, right there in the middle that says call now for a free 1985 Florex music demo tape. Well, we had gotten from black and white ads to being full color, as you can see right there by the time 1985 came along. Notice that there is an 800 number right there, and you had to have a different 800 number in the state you were in back in those days. Couldn't have the same 800 number in the state you were in as you had nationwide. And look at the very bottom where you're seeing American Express, MasterCard, and Visa. Very unusual, believe me. It's not easy to get hooked up to be able to take credit cards, especially back then. So let me show you what the first uh, first one looked at. If you can hit slide nine there, Russell, and you'll actually see what I look like now. And Eric Alvarez. In fact, you're seeing the little babies there in black and white in the middle. And then you see Eric as he looks today on the left and me on the right over there. So yes, we have a little less hair and uh, grayer at that. But you can see what's going on here. Uh, it, we're talking, if you see the United Productions, it's orchestrated competition music where we were still trying to be all things to all people. Gymnastics, ice skating, drill teams are right there is what we were advertising back then. And that was when we weren't just making one song and trying to sell it over and over again. We were doing it customized each time and the people would literally come into the studio and we would cut it for them. And that is not a good way to get rich. So we had to disconnect from that. We had to figure out how we were going to do that. And that's where gymnastics really opened itself up. Uh, next one, Russell, number 10. Okay. Again, it's, uh, we can almost, uh, let me just point out where we're getting ready to go with this is to, uh, is to go to select the target market. Uh, uh, going up to the second step right there, we're still we're going to uh, identify how do we find out who our customer was with us. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, so I, I have a, a oh, question sure. here, which is probably a really good one um, for an entrepreneur. It probably happens a lot. Um, they're saying, uh, what do you do when you are constantly given the answer no? <laughs> and I guess they're talking about in starting a business or you know trying to get it off the ground. Oh, that's a that's a great question too. Believe me, I had an awful lot of no's. Uh, it, I'll, uh, my uh, MBA is in marketing, and uh, I'll tell you the best one-liner I ever heard. And actually, you'll even hear it in this presentation before I'm over. Before it's over, is find out what the objections are. And once you've answered every one of the objections, all you have left to do is ask for the sale. So when you keep hearing no, don't hear no, hear the only reason I didn't say yes is because of this and this and this. Now you have three things that you need to address in order to be able to know how to get a yes out of them. Because if they don't have any objections to buying or giving you or doing whatever you've asked, then you're going to be able to get it. So being able to address the objections is probably the best way to keep those no's from happening. It's it, Yeah, you have to have a little bit of a tough skin because you have to get a bunch of no's to figure out what, it, what needs to happen in order to get there. Were there others, Russell? Uh, well, I've got a couple others. I think maybe we can save a few of these for the end. Okay, go ahead. Move on to the next one here for you. 
so in uh, in selecting the target market, it, it's really interesting because the gymnasts themselves were often like between nine and fifteen years old, and uh, you know it, they don't have any money. So again, you could sit there and think, okay, it's mom and dad who are actually going to buy this thing, but they're only going to do what the coach tells them to do. And often the coach is hiring a choreographer to come in to be able to work with them on their floor exercise. Uh, by the way, the music that they use is when they have that great big blue carpet out there, and the girls go running from one end to the other and do the double backflips and all of that. That is the floor exercise competition. Unlike the uneven bar or the uh, you know or the vault uh, you know that they uh, that they wind up doing the floor exercise was uh, just one of four events that they wind up doing so I uh, that's specifically where the music was being used here so we didn't know how to be able to reach the customers and then all of a sudden I found out that they were having a uh, uh, regional gymnastics meet. And I thought, Eric, let's go down to this regional gymnastics meet. We're going to be able to meet every one of the coaches at this competition, which you would think would be wonderful. And we went down there with flyers and business cards and found out that we were really shooting ourselves in the foot. Because when you go to these coaches at this regional gymnastics meet, they're very intent on winning the regional gymnastics meet and they don't give a darn about their gymnastics florex music at that time because they've already got that whole thing taken care of and they don't even want to talk to you and if you try to you know hand them your card or a brochure they tell you get out of my way kid and so if you're wondering what do you do with a no I had to listen to the objection that they had right there and said this is not a good time so I had to figure out what do I do now in order to catch them at the right time uh, I tell you that it, I was trying to find out where do I get a mailing list for the gyms all across the United States, and I was having a heck of a time with that. Uh, just a funny, quick story. I thought, you know what? At that time, phone books were really big, and they were free. And I actually called and said, could you start delivering the phone books for the major cities in each state? Well, I had only gotten three or four states in before I felt like I had opened up uh, the Sorcerer's Apprentice movie for Disney. Remember when Mickey Mouse uh, gets the little brooms to start bringing in the water for him? And the next thing you know, he's flooded the place out. I mean, I had half the studio full of phone books before I even had three states covered. So I, uh, I turned that off and said, this is a bad idea. And we had to figure out how in the world do we reach them at a time where these coaches are willing to talk to us. And the bottom line to that came out to be trade shows, where they go to a trade show and they want to learn about the latest gymnastic equipment or greatest gymnastic wear or what are the best moves and how are they changing the scoring and judging of everything. And so you really have to be able to attack the, uh, or, or go after them where they are at these trade shows is when they're trying to find out what's the latest thing about floor exercise music. And that's when they're there to try to figure it out. Now you have to figure out how do you get them to want to buy your product. Next slide. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but we went ahead, and this is our first move in which we didn't make gymnastics. I mean, we made gymnastics the lead, put a gymnast on there. That It's a shame this is in black and white because that's a beautiful picture in color. Those little ting lights behind it are in rainbows and everything else. But uh, the perfect 10 being uh, how they score things in, uh, in the Olympics. And so that was our first effort of being able to say, okay, gymnastics is on top. This drill team ice skating stuff is just off to the side, but we don't want to drop it all together because we still made a lot of money off of it. And so this was where we said, now we're going to start focusing on gymnastics and uh, instead of trying to just be all things to all people. It was hard to let go of that because we were making, still making good money off of ice skating and drill team, but it was actually hurting us to dilute our efforts to go in that way. Next slide. All right, so here's where we had to come up, and this is probably the first major innovation that I ever had in my life, in which I came up with something that, that was revolutionary. This really changed the entire gymnastics music industry from what it was to what it wound up being after we got done with it. And that is that, uh, and now you're seeing that whole line of uh, make a list of the customer objections and have a good answer to every one of them. What were the objections that they had? They didn't want to spend the thousands of dollars to be able to get a, a saw. It needed to be inexpensive, and but they still wanted it to be of a good quality. Remember that pause button editing that they had was just horrible. And they wanted to be able to hear the entire song from beginning to end before they bought it. Now, uh, they wanted to have all the usual payment options. and. Then you have to come up to, you need to meet your own objections as well. I could have just put every song that we had 
onto and cassette tapes were all they had back in those days. I could have put every song that we got ever put together for gymnastics just end to end to end onto a cassette tape and then uh, let them take that and then they could call us up afterward and say I'd like to be able to buy this one or that one or whatever. The problem is is that if I give them the song beginning to end they're going to be able to have the thing to just record themselves on their own, their own little cassette and they would never have to buy anything from us. So that uh, that was our objection that had to be able to, we needed to get paid. <laughs> so our objection was making sure that they could have all their objections met and yet we would still be able to get paid for our efforts on that. So we, uh, I went back, here's another one of marketing. If you can't fix it, you feature it. And one of the things that it was really a, a, a pain to have to edit around the lyrics of a song. So you get a song that's very popular on the radio and all I can use are the instrumental portions of it. And so that's where the editing was really you know, popular to just get that together like that. But here's the, uh, the problem. I, I put that song together and I need to be able to protect it for us and they need to be able to hear it. Now remember where Eric and I met. We were both disc jockeys. And being disc jockeys or radio broadcasters, we talk over the beginning and end of a song all the time. So we'd say, hi, welcome to United Productions. And the name of this song is such and such. It's a minute, 22 seconds. And the reference number to order it is B8. And then we would go ahead and play the whole song. And at the end of it, like five seconds before the song starts to end, we'd just give them the same. It was B8, and a minute 22, and that was uh, whatever the name of the title was. In the middle, we found out that it was a great marketing thing to put this really big, deep, uh, uh, echoey voice, you know, with reverb on it, and it went, United Productions, like that, in the middle of the song a couple of times, so even if they cut the beginning and the end of it off, they couldn't steal the song. And it was good marketing, because the people would be able to hear the company name over and over and over again. So that was really a, uh, a awesome uh, approach. And then we put the, uh, we actually did two C120 cassettes, which was four hours worth of music because uh, you had an hour on each side of the cassettes. We would have the demonstration tapes made up of four hours worth of our music and they would just have to pop that thing into a cassette player in the gym while the uh, gymnasts were warming up, where, you know, doing their exercises, working on other events, and they go, I like that song, and they'd be able to pick it right out from that. It solved every objection they had, especially once we got an 800 number to be able to order from and were able to accept Visa, MasterCard, American Express. Go ahead and check the uh, next slide there, Russell, number 14. Okay. Um, go. Okay, what you're seeing here is a list that went out with the demonstration tapes, and this is how we did it. Uh, sorry, I've got all my handwritten notes on it. I don't even have the original artwork for these things anymore. But what you're seeing there is the uh, if we put the titles on alphabetically, and then after we had the brand new release songs went A to Z, then we started over again and filled up the four hours remaining four hours of cassettes with past hits. I, we had a library by the time we were done with this of over 2,000 songs, so it was never a problem of being able to have enough, uh, uh, shall I say, variety in what they were getting ready to order. And the best part of this was, is where did we get this new, uh, uh, new material? It was coming from the gymnasts themselves, because what we did was we would say, we will cut your music for you custom for the same price as we charge for any song on the demonstration tape, but you have to do the homework. You have to be able to tell us what pieces and parts of the song and kind of put a blueprint cassette together of the pieces and parts, send us the record of the CD and what, by the way, they had CDs by then, uh, uh, that we will put this thing together. And then we would edit it and we would keep it off of our demonstration tape for the next year. People before that time were spending enough money on that uh, single piano or, or a guitar piece that they were paying, oh, a few hundred dollars for it, and that made them want to use that same song for a number of years. When we got it down to $25 per song, they would change it every year, and that's how the ones that really cared to make sure nobody else had what they had was exclusive to them. And notice what else happened with that is that you wind up having those people that are the experts in the business know exactly what music they want to have and the way to be able to cut that music were the ones that were doing our work for us and paying us to be able to have our music for the latest uh, uh, demonstration tapes for the new year. So it's as good as it gets as far as how you're be, uh, able to put this together. Next slide, Russell, number 15. Yeah, I, I have a couple questions here for you. Um, how long did it take you to 
do all the, the research, planning, and finding whoops, finding your target market, uh, and then getting the, the product out to it. Had I not been so new, it, it probably took about a year to really know what we were doing. Uh, had it, if it was today, it wouldn't have taken me 30 days because I know what to do now when it comes to looking it up. But I was such a babe in the woods back then trying to figure all this stuff out without having any help. I, I, I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, I don't know where that came from. Maybe I came from the mailman or something. Because <laughs> it's not in my family to be an entrepreneur like that. But I, uh, uh, again, the, the more you know how to do this, the more times you do it, the less time it'll take. But if you go at it blindly from the beginning, that's why I say it really helps to go work for a competitor or somebody that's already doing what it is that you want to do to see how they solve all these problems. Um, one of the other questions here is about finding the resources, um, you know, to identify your target market. Mm -hmm. uh, can you kind of talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, it, I can. Uh, for instance, it took us a while uh, until we got to know any of the gymnasts well enough. Uh, so happens I went to Cal State Fullerton and the top women's gymnastics team in the United States in the NCAA at that time was the Cal State Fullerton women's gymnastics team. So I wound up cutting all their music for them and they were right there, you know, in my backyard and uh, wound up talking to the coach and that's where I started finding out about trade magazines, where the trade shows were, who were the key shakers and movers in that business. It's getting to know the people that are on the inside, be able to network with them and get the right introductions. And that's where I started to get the real information. But it took me a while to be able to find out who those people were. Okay. Uh, one other question before we move on. Um, this, this is an interesting one. Uh, do you think now that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, do you think now that uh, we're in 2015 that it's easier to get a business up and running compared to when you started this one? Uh, not any different in terms of how to get a business up and running because of the internet and how many things that, uh, believe me, if I was doing this United Productions business today, I mean, we did incredibly well. In fact, I'll tell you, I, I don't know if you know what a market share is, but it's like if, uh, you know, there's a million dollars uh, of a product sold total to every customer in America and you have a 50% market share, that means half a million uh, of those one million dollars in sales go to you. We had a 50% market share of the gymnastics business. And the companies that have a 50% market share are things like Tide Laundry Detergent and Coca-Cola. I mean, it, it was, we just absolutely dominated this business, even though it was, you know, being a big frog in a little pond. Uh, it, it really does make a difference to, uh, to be able to have that kind of clout uh, going through there. It, 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 repeat the question again because I'm thinking I either answered it or I didn't quite. Well, just whether it's easier now uh, to start a business. Well, it, than I, it, what I was saying with the internet, and that's a, the sentence I didn't add in there. The, uh, the thing at the end that I was trying to go for at the end, if I was to have been had the uh, internet available to me at that time, this thing would have been huge because it solves all of the other problems of having to go through the mail and having to have people manning telephones and they could just download the music off of the internet instead of having to have it reported onto a cassette and mailed out. There wouldn't have been any demonstration tapes at all. You could have just continued to listen to everything and not been able to download it unless you paid the money. So it, uh, yeah, I believe me, it is a lot easier to do some things because of the internet today, but it is really just technology improvements that make things more efficient. I don't say that it's a lot easier to do it. It's just more efficient and you can make more money at it in a lot less time. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go on okay. to the next slide for you here. Sure. Identify objectives. This is, this is really important. That top line that says, did we want to capture 100% of the gymnastic music market? And the answer is no. There were people, especially our U.S. Olympians, who wanted to be, you know, have that custom music that no one else would have ever. And they were willing to pay a couple of thousand dollars to get it. Of course, they had the budget, you know, to be able to back them up to get there. 
what we wanted to do was to be the Chevrolet of the business. It said, we're going to edit a song once, and we're going to resell, sell it repeatedly for $25 each. And I'll tell you, some of our better sellers were going for more than 200 to 300 times a year. So you take one song and just uh, two to 300 times add it up by $25 each. We were you know, probably grossing maybe $150,000 off of doing what ended up taking me maybe 10 or 15 hours a week to, uh, to keep up with the business. So I was doing plenty of other things while I was doing this United Productions at the same time. Uh, then you have to figure out how to make use of everything. You remember like the Indians, uh, American, Native Americans say that, uh, you know, we use every part of the buffalo. Well, <clears throat> remember, we only got up to a two-hour, uh, we had a two-hour time limit on the demonstration tape. And so if you want to go ahead and, and hit the uh, next uh, slide there. Russell, will, uh, you'll see what we did. With all of the music that got pushed off of the demonstration tape, we wound up making packages out of them of 10 songs. So instead of buying one song for $25, you were able to get 10 for 30, but they were the old things. It'd be like buying a used car at that point. But the thing we made sure of is that each one of those packages had a bestseller on it from the past, at least two actually, in each one of those packages. So you go in there and say, oh my gosh, this thing will, you know, remember when this thing was a hit and that was a hit? Well, two of the 10 were real big hits and the other ones were kind of dogs. But for the uh, gymnastics clubs that really needed to have a, uh, a very inexpensive way to get into their floor exercise music, this definitely was a, was a win for them. So if you wanted the high end, the Rolls Royce, you could have us do your customized music. If you wanted, uh, you know, something in the in the Cadillac range, then you could buy the newest stuff off of the demonstration tape. And if you just wanted the Chevrolet, then you would, uh, you know, be able to go on down to the packages and so on. Uh, actually, the next uh, slide is just going to be the graphic again. So why don't you skip it to the second uh, one after that? It says set budget, okay. develop promotional mix. Okay. All right. Now you have to be able to set a budget. Well, I'll tell you, it was really easy for us. We went to the checking account and saw we had $10,000 in it. <laughs> and so that was where our budget was. We had to figure out how do you spend $10,000 you know, when you've never done this before, is it better to go out there and try to buy an ad? Because that, that fancy ad you saw with the, uh, you know, the squares, the, you know, infinity squares going off into the sky that showed the, the uh, credit cards and the 800 number, that was a $2,000 ad per month. And all of a sudden, you've got five ads that went out there, and did you get anybody to, uh, to do anything with it? And the answer is no. That ad only came out after people, we only started spending that two grand a month after people knew who we were. We had to get established, and the way to do that, I mentioned, was from trade shows. Now we had to figure out how in the world do you get them to come to your booth in the trade show. No one had ever heard of United Productions. And it doesn't say anything about gymnastics in the in the company name. And we could sit there and say Florex Music and they're like, oh, it's going to be somebody that plays a piano or a guitar and makes a recording of it for us. And so they had no idea what it was that we were offering them because nobody had done it before. So we had to get them over to our desk and I, uh, you know, table, and we had the demonstration tape that we would hand them. The demonstration tape absolutely it cost us for about three dollars to have a set of two of them, but we had to give them away because people aren't going to buy something that they don't know what it is. Why do you want three dollars from me? To heck with it. We said we're going to take this ten thousand dollars. We're going to go to this trade show, and we took seven hundred. They had a thousand, um, no, I'm sorry, only 800 people show up there. We took 700 demonstration sets of tapes with us and we got rid of all of them. So we put a set of demonstration tapes in the hands of just about everyone in there. We never did start charging for them. By the way, we had a lot of competitors that came along and tried to duplicate what we did. Every one of them was charging money for the demonstration tapes. We always gave them away for free. And let me tell you why. First of all, it puts you at a tremendous advantage over the competition. Second of all, we found out no matter how many demonstration tapes we gave away, we consistently stayed with a factor of one and a half uh, sales for uh, individual song sales, which wound up $25 each, would be $37.50. We would get $37.50 of revenue for every $3 tape set that we handed out. Tell me how many you want to hand out. You make as many as you possibly can and continue to hand them out to anybody that will take them if you keep having that kind of success. So that's why we always continue to make them free from that time on. You call us on our 800 number and we send the demo tapes out to you for free. 
and that was definitely overcoming all their objections. So how did we get them into the trade show? Seriously, you ch you didn't. We didn't need anything huge, but. Um, You've probably seen these cute little thing in a Spencer Yes or a Hallmark store or something like that that's, that's sound activated and it was, I don't know, how I, I wish I had a picture of it. It's a dancing flower. It's not a live flower. It's a little plastic thing, but it, it just really caught your eye because back there in 1980, nobody had these things. And we put this, you know, a couple of little dancing flowers up there that were just getting down to their United Productions music they were listening to right there. So you see these little dancing flowers. And we would have a different gimmick every year. One year, we just kept the chocolate chip cookies coming. And that seemed to work really well, which surprised me because I thought gymnasts weren't going to be all that excited about eating chocolate chip cookies. I was wrong. So the, uh, the coaches and everybody else, actually, most of the coaches were pretty overweight and always surprised me that they weren't in better shape than you would think uh, coming from where they do. So you just have some kind of a gimmick to get them over there, and once they show up, they say, would you like your free demonstration tapes of Florex music, and it's hard to say no to that. Uh, later on, we wound up uh, being so successful, we didn't have to do anything special. We put the ads out there. They call us. We did do, and this is an interesting one, we do a postcard mailing to everybody that was on our mailing list saying our latest demonstration tapes were available, and all they had to do was take the postcard, turn it inside out, and for free, we, uh, they could just send it back to us, making any changes to their address that they needed to, and send it back to us, and then we were able to send them out the latest demonstration tapes. When you do a direct mail campaign, you expect, you jump up and down if you get a 1% to 2% return on anything that's direct mailed out. We were averaging about a 25% return when we would mail those postcards out. So it was really, really a, a successful deal. Uh, go ahead and skip the graphic again, Russell, so you can go to the implement plans and evaluate the results. Okay. All right. So we're about to uh, go into the demise. What happened to United Productions after all that time? Like I said, it got up to, it was making about $10,000 a year when we were doing it by the hour, and it got up to about $150,000 a year working maybe 10 to 15 hours a week. By the way, the uh, most businesses are happy to net about 10% of whatever their gross sales are uh, out there with a lot of service businesses. We were close to 65%. So in other words, if we made $100,000, we would net 65% instead of 10% as most service businesses end up being. So we were just, uh, it was a phenomenal business. I'm sorry that it did go away. And why did it go away? It was because we weren't able, we unknowingly fell out of our marketing plan. Uh, it's probably so long ago now, you folks don't even remember the name Dominique Dawes. But uh, uh, go ahead and, and click to the next uh, pictures, or next slide, Russell, because it shows a picture of her. So Dominique Dawes right there was the first women's gymnast in the Olympics to ever win the individual gold medal. And she used a $25 song from United Productions. And I had no idea that they had bought it. And what was interesting was is that I get called up by um, ABC, who was uh, uh, promoting or, or airing the uh, Olympics in uh, 1996, and said, gee, we need to get your licensing information because this uh, you know, routine is going to go out to the entire world, and we need to be able to go ahead and get our own uh, approvals on that. And, of course, I had to say, uh, you know, I fall in between ASCAP and BMI and Harry Fox, and they said, yeah, I'm afraid that's not going to work this time. We're really going to need to go do that. So they did, and they contacted the right people, and the right people contacted me with a cease and desist letter and said, here's your deal. We're going to charge you $600 every time you sell one of these songs. So our prices would have gone from $25 each up to $625 per song, and I had to just cease and desist at that point and decide not to do it. Now, the uh, I think you saw that Floor Express Music, or Floor Music Express, forget their name. Uh, they are still around to today. It is somebody that is still doing the synthesizer stuff and redoing the music that falls under Harry Fox. So, yeah, if you want to get into that business, go ahead. That is just the kind of stuff that would bore me to death. So, yes, thank you very much, Dominique Dawes. I'm so glad you used our $25 soundtrack. In fact, I went into our database, and I just looked up her name, and there it was. I had her dad, her dad's address and his credit card number all sitting there from someplace in Texas, wherever she grew up. Uh, last slide there, Russell, and I'm done. Okay. 
Uh, this is one, and again, it, it, it's, uh, since this is being recorded, you'll be able to go back and hit pause if you really want to get a look at this thing. Uh, but it's a really good thing of looking at the various ways to be able to advertise, whether it be the internet, newspapers, magazines, direct mail, outdoor radio, or television, and it gives you the advantages and disadvantages of each. Just take a look at the uh, internet down at the bottom is the only one I'm going to go into. But you can, uh, with the internet, you can get highly targeted uh, people. I mean, you go in there, you definitely got their attention because they at least have to delete it if nothing else. You get immediate results from this stuff. It's not like you mail it out and wonder, you know, days later if they're getting back to you or not. You can just go ahead and have a click on this and you go right to your website and it's interactive so that they, uh, you know, once they're on your website, they can go ahead and order right there. So all of those advantages are awesome, which I didn't have. Uh, it is a limited audience, uh, only <laughs> that becomes, you can tell this is an older textbook because it's not nearly the limited audience today it was back then. I think when this was uh, first put together, maybe 60% of the people had email back then. I think it's probably closer to 80% of the people in the U.S. Have, uh, have email access. High clutter because you just have so much spam going on and people are really afraid to click on things that send you to a website knowing how much uh, you know malware and phishing goes on these days. So if you can overcome those disadvantages, you have a lot of huge advantages there. So I'm good for questions at this point, Russell. Okay, um, I have a few here. Um, first one, we've had uh, several questions about home-based biz businesses. Um, different types, but uh, essentially any advice on home-based businesses and how to go about getting them started? Uh, sure. Uh, first of all, let me tell you, United Productions was a home-based business. Remember, it started in my uh, partner's garage. He and I uh, actually split the uh, two businesses up. I took the No Alcohol nightclub initially, and then I bought the recording studio back from him later on. I, I, we're good friends to this day. As you can tell, if I have current pictures of him, he and I are still corresponding all the time. He lives up in uh, Sacramento and works as a uh, PR guy for the uh, state of California. Uh, anyway, the, uh, it was a home business out of his parents' garage at the time because he was, I don't know, maybe 20 years old at that point. And uh, later on, even though we did move it into a commercial facility and made a studio out of it, uh, after it wound up just running, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, when my wife took it over, we cleared out a bedroom and turned the recording studio into the bedroom. Uh, you know, so it's like a home office right there, and we were able to run the 800 number and all the credit card stuff and everything else uh, being digital. You know, instead of having this huge library of reel-to-reel -reel tapes, everything being digital was uh, now sitting on computers that we were able to do at a certain point. So this particular business we could do as a home business. It is not hard to do. The one thing that I will say, we never had enough traffic that we had to worry about uh, interfering with our neighbors. If you have a home business and you interfere with your neighbors and they complain to the city, whatever city you belong to, they have code enforcement people that will come out and literally shut you down. So you have to be careful that if you have a lot of home traffic or if you, you know, like park a whole bunch of trucks and, you know, whatever is involved in your business, if it really involves uh, disturbing your neighbors, you could be in trouble with that. But it's not hard to get a license. Most uh, cities, if you're in uh, New York or L.A., it's probably $5,000. But if you're in Phoenix, like I am, I think it's 50 bucks, uh, you know, to be able to get a license. The big cities tend to just gouge the heck out of you for that sort of thing. But it's usually not... Uh, not that expensive to set up a business at home. One thing I will tell you is that uh, you are going to want to make sure that you are insured because it's not that difficult to get insurance uh, you know, for a home business. And then if somebody slips and falls or you uh, you know, make a mistake some long, somewhere along the way, get with an insurance agent, tell them what you want to do and let them sell you you know, a couple hundred dollars a year worth of insurance to make sure that you're covered on that so that you don't have any trouble. Because your homeowner's insurance, if you're running a home business, will say, we don't owe anything on this. And so it's as good as being not insured at all. Um, I have a question here about business plans. Um, any th thoughts on how to avoid some of the basic mistakes of uh, business plan uh, writing? Hmm. Well, it's a great question. It's tough to answer in a, in a short period of time. Uh, one thing that... Uh, <laughs> You try to get artists to show you the first things that they ever put together, you know, in terms of a painting or a drawing, they won't do it. 
Uh, and the next presentation that uh, Russell referred to earlier as far as the teenager no alcohol nightclub that uh, probably do a few months from now, I actually show part of the business plan that Eric and I put together for that business. Uh, to be able to, and it was done with a manual typewriter. So believe me, that's a, that's a tough thing to put together. What is, uh, the mistakes that you can make are a lot fewer now than they were back when he and I were putting that together at the time. And that is, you can get a great deal of help on the, uh, you know, online. Just start googling the heck out of the stuff, reading enough of those things, and and seeing what everybody else has done for a business plan, and then figure out what's right and appropriate for you. There's a very different kind of business plan that you would put together for the SBA that, well, it's not that different, but it, they have a particular format they like you to follow uh, as opposed to what you would have in, uh, uh, you know, for venture capitalists or maybe for uh, even mom and dad if that were the, the direction you were going. Okay, I have another question here. Um, someone's asking about uh, working for a competitor, you know, to kind of learn uh, that particular business, whatever it is, you know, how long do you suggest that you work for a, a competitor before branching out on your own? Oh, I'm not so sure that, uh, it, believe me, one of the reasons why we were successful with uh, United Productions is that Eric and I had day jobs uh, while we were doing that. It took us some um, 1980, we probably didn't do strictly uh, the self-employment, counted on getting the money out of the self-employment venture until we started together in 1978, it was 1981 when we finally were big enough to be able to just pull the money out of the businesses themselves. So I, I strongly suggest if you get that job with them, go ahead and, and continue to work something else, figuring out how to do what it is that you do part-time or hiring somebody else so that you continue to have cash flow coming in while you're trying to get your business started. The number one reason why a business, a new business goes under is it's undercapitalized. 95% of the time when it goes under in the first year is because it was undercapitalized, not because it wasn't a good idea. Um, yeah, I have another one here kind of along that line. What, what's the best advice you can give someone that has little uh, or to no budget or support from family and friends to get a business up and running? Well, uh, actually, there, here's one right off the bat. It's always easier to do a service business than it is to do one where you actually have a product. And the reason being, as a service business, what you're doing is selling your labor, what it is that you do, uh, as opposed to you having to go out there and have a parking lot full of cars that you need to sell or you know a million widgets and in, uh, inventory sitting on shelves ready to be shipped out if you see what I mean. So uh, definitely if you have no money backing you up you want to be able to do it according to a service and then you want to be able to do it uh, make sure that you have a a source of income that you live off of so that you're not counting on the business as I said before. Okay. Um, I have someone here that mentioned earlier about turning a hobby into a business. Um, what, what, what are some of the pitfalls of that? Well, uh, uh, let me start with the pros of, the, of that particular question because if it's a hobby, it's something that you have a passion for, a love for. And uh, believe me, I, I to this day remember the first time I was being taught how to edit something. And, you know, it's like somebody was reading a script and they made a mistake and then they went back and picked up where they left off and then he physically cut that tape apart and he put the two pieces together and put a, a literal piece of scotch tape, it was a specific kind, but scotch tape over that and it, you could not tell that he had made the edit on there. I was so fascinated with that, I didn't know I was going to be doing it for the next 20 years of my life. And uh, it, that was okay because you, it, I was good at it and, uh, and it and it made it so that it was easy even for somebody like me who does not like doing the same thing over and over. I found doing that really didn't get that old. There were a lot of other things I didn't like just making recordings and processing credit cards and you know taking orders down over the phone and all that was not so exciting but uh, but the actual creative side that you have the hobby out of yes I strongly recommend if you can figure out a way to make a living off of that 
go ahead and do it. But don't count on making a living off of that until it's up and running on its own. If you try to do this stuff without having a secondary or a primary, if you will, source of uh, income, continue to work another job until you can get this thing to stand on its own. Do you have to work an awful lot of hours to make that happen? The answer is yes, and I did. Um, okay, I have another one here. Uh, I'm just trying to go through these here. They're popping in faster than I can read them. Um, I, I think we might have asked this before, but um, marketing resources. Uh, you know, what what are what resources can someone use for um, you know finding the, the the client? And there's a lot of questions about just finding your first client if you're a home-based business or if you have your own business. You know, what are some of the ways to go about kind of getting those first few? Uh, clients and, and uh, you know getting a start. Well, what uh, what we wound up doing in the gymnastics business, I mentioned it, uh, uh, just alluded to it before, was we took the gymnastics coach for Cal State Fullerton, whose name was Len Rogers, and uh, uh, not only did I just use him as a wealth of information as far as who the movers and shakers were, but I wound up being able to get his endorsement for everything that we did. Yeah, even if, it, by the way, he was a nice enough guy. He went ahead and paid us for everything that we did for him uh, to begin with, and he gave us the endorsements, and we were, you know, good enough to go ahead and buy ads and their programs and all the rest of that. So it was a scratch each other's back kind of situation. Uh, but on the other hand, to be able to <clears throat> take the top coach, you know, for um, for women's gymnastics and say, I use United Productions Music exclusively and be able to center an ad campaign around that was really helpful. So it, uh, it, that's it. Go out there, find a mover, a shaker, somebody that would be a great spokesperson or at least a referral to be able to say, I like this stuff, you'll like it too, and see what you can do to be able to scratch each other's backs to be able to get that kind of a recommendation from them. Okay, I have another question here. Uh, when should a, a new business license co copyright their business name? Uh, you, you actually don't have a problem with that unless somebody is in the same city as you are. For instance, have you noticed how many yellow cab companies there are and they're not all the same company? So if you're in, uh, you know, I live in the, uh, Scottsdale, which is right next door to Phoenix, I can wind up being Yellow Cab of Scottsdale if nobody has it, even if there's a Yellow Cab of Phoenix. It's, uh, it, it, when you're talking about uh, copywriting, that, uh, that's kind of an interesting, uh, for instance, song titles can't be copyrighted, book titles can't be copyrighted, movie titles can't be copyrighted, uh, but the contents within them can be. So it's uh, it, the name that you would have a problem with is if you tried to do a uh, social media network and call it Facebook or Facebooking or something like that, so that uh, so that you get in trouble with it. Uh, I think what you're what you're probably alluding to a little more would either be a trademark or a service mark. A uh, trademark would be for a product. A service mark would be um, uh, well, like for Penn Foster. I'm sure Penn Foster has a service mark on its Penn Foster logo, even though it's not actually a product that's being sold. Whereas uh, Nike would have both a service and a trademark. They have the Nike logo itself, which is a service mark, and then you have all of the clothing and sporting gear that um, that they have, and that requires a trademark. That's the difference between those two. Uh, when do you want to do that? Almost immediately. If you really need to have a trade or a service mark, and by the way, it's not very expensive to do it. Uh, I, I want to say most states would be a hundred bucks in order to be able to get that done. And you can pull. You can go to the um, uh, you can Google it in whatever state you're in. You can download the form, take a picture of whatever it is that you're trying to get a service mark of, and send that with the form and a hundred dollar check or whatever they're asking for uh, through the mail to them, and you get it that e that easy. Okay, I have uh, one that's um, kind of interesting. Uh, they're an older person. You know, is it a good idea to start a business in their 40s or 50s? Well, I'm still, I, I was much older than that when I was starting other businesses, so I'd have to say yes. I think, I especially think that uh, I know how much better I was at it when I was older and had experience and all of that, so I don't see that as being a negative at all. I see it as being a positive to have, to be older, to have experience, to, you know, have a, a little more 
be a little more world wise as it is in, in uh, how to go about things. And you have a lot more trust in yourself as far as, uh, I'll tell you, some of the it, it, question came up earlier as far as some of the biggest mistakes. Uh, I mentioned the one in terms of partnership, but uh, another one was to start trusting other people's uh, points of view, perspectives, opinions, decisions more than my own just because they were alleged experts. And, I, and frankly, I, it, maybe it's unique to me because I, I uh, wound up at having a lot of gifts in life. But uh, I can tell you that I was rarely wrong when something just really chewed at me in my gut and said, I don't feel like they're right. But, you know, this guy's a lawyer or this guy's a CPA or this guy's doing it, you know, been doing this thing for a long time. I should be listening to that. Yes, you should listen to him, but don't listen to him more than your gut. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, I have another one here, and I think I already know the answer to this, but um, they're asking, you know, what's the best way to start as far as uh, an ownership uh, situation is concerned? Is it better to start on your own or to uh, work with a partner? Well, uh, I can tell you if you if you start with the right partner, and I wouldn't do it any different than I did with uh, than I did with Eric. Even though I said he and I were not the right fit uh, for the ultimate partnership, uh, you know, we we had a pretty good run for five years uh, as far as that went. Got along well. Heck, I, you know, he's the best man at my wedding and all that. So, in uh, you know, it wasn't that it wasn't a tough time when he and I were breaking that partnership up between us, uh, there were some tough moments, but uh, you know, we're still great friends to this day. You tend to get over it. Now, is it better to go ahead and be an individual or start with a partner? I think that depends on who you are. I, uh, I would call myself a jack of all trades and a master of none. In other words, I, you can probably tell just by the way I can answer the questions that I have an eclectic background in which I've done just about everything out there, not to any great extent like I could you know, hang a shingle out and say I'm an expert in this, that, or the other thing, but I, can, I certainly have a lot of experience in all these different uh, aspects of business. And if you have that kind of a background, you can probably do it on your own. I can tell you that, um, I'm trying to think of the other, I, I haven't had a partner in uh, business since 1997. So I would, so from 1978, so almost 20 years, I would have partners involved along the way. And then all of a sudden after that time, I, I wound up doing everything on my own. So I think it's a function of how much confidence you have in yourself and how much you actually know that you don't uh, need to bring some other people in in order to have that expertise. Okay. All right. Well, that's a, a great ending to our webinar. Um, I'm going to wrap it up at this point. It's about 7.30. Um, Let, uh, can I just do a quick... Uh, Russell, can yeah. I do a promo on the uh, on the next one? The oh, the, te sure. the teenage <laughs> yeah, the teenage nightclub, uh, no alcohol nightclub, uh, actually came along in uh, in 1981 after uh, Eric and I have been doing this for about three years. Believe me, when we go into that, I didn't talk about this aspect of it, but the recording studio went into video. So not only do we talk about the entertainment business and being able to do. Uh, you know, the nightclub with no alcohol, we got involved in a television show that was much like American Bandstand or Soul Train, in which I'll be able to talk about what it was like to be able to work with uh, Will Smith, Paula Abdul, New Kids on the Block, a whole bunch of huge names out there that we had on this uh, TV dance show that was all a part of the uh, nightclub. I think, believe me, if, if you found this exciting at all, that one will be 10 times more exciting and I'll have video of all those people when they look really young. <laughs> okay, great. All right, well, um, we're going to wrap it up at this point. Um, you can take a breath now, John. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us today uh, or tonight, uh, and I want to have a special thank you for uh, John. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, talk with our students. And uh, as John said, we'll be having another one after the new year. Um, so be on the lookout for uh, the uh, the ad to, for that as well. So. Um, we will, and I just want to know, there were quite a few questions in here about getting the PowerPoint. Um, this uh, webinar will be, is recorded and will be put up on the community, so you'll be able to uh, review it uh, 
whenever you want. Um, so it'll be in the business area of the community uh, under the academic section. So uh, look for that probably in about two or three days. So I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope this was informative for everybody. And uh, I can see from some of the comments here that everybody uh, seemed to enjoy it. So uh, we'll be talking to you again uh, after the new year. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks.